Washington Grown is brought to you by the Washington State Department of Agriculture's Specialty Crop Block Grant Program and the Washington Hospitality Association. Hi everyone, I'm Christy Gordson and welcome to Washington Grown. I'm on a fourth generation farm in the Skagit Valley and it grows a variety of different crops including cabbage. And that's what this episode is all about. We'll cook cabbage in two different ways at Manu's Bodega in Seattle. Now we just need more beer. Exactly. <laughs> Where's the beer? Then Val is touring Ole Kraut to learn what it takes to make raw, handcrafted sauerkraut. I like that. <laughs> and Tomas is seeing what people think of another type of cabbage dish, kimchi. I've had kimchi in Korea before. Oh, no, no, so, so the real deal. The real deal. And this is good. All this and much more today on Washington Grown. Beautiful carrots. <laughs> gotta go fast. Hot diggity. How good is that one? Tucked away in downtown Seattle's Pioneer Square, you'll find a little Latin hideaway called Manu's Bodega. This cozy eatery is full of vibrant Caribbean colors and savory aromas. Customers can't get enough of the authentic food and welcoming atmosphere. It just feels like a family neighborhood home type restaurant where you could go and get served by your best friend's mom. He just brings a lot of different flavors and textures and everything to his food, so I, re I really appreciate that. We're just a tiny little 18 seat restaurant just doing Latin American food. And you come in, automatically you kind of feel like you're transported to a Latin country. And that was our goal behind you know, the bright colors and the food and everything else that, that, that we're doing here. When owner Manu Alfal first came to Seattle, he noticed a void in the city's Latin American cuisine. So he decided to open up shop with menu items inspired by his childhood in the Dominican Republic. There just wasn't a real Latin presence uh, as far as food went. So I said, hey, I want to kind of get into restaurants. It's like, let's just start small and see you know how it goes. Just a really chill uh, Dominican uh, spot. Make sure you get enough green sauce. Can I get some more green sauce, everyone says. And then they tell someone else, they tell someone else, they tell someone else. Later in the show, Manu will be showing me how to prepare cabbage in two different and delicious ways. Now we just need more beer. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Where's the beer? in the Skagit Valley, which is a very special place for agriculture. Within a short drive, you'll find potatoes, leeks, tulips, and just about any other crop you can imagine, including cabbage. I caught up with a grower who's been growing cabbage for decades. I'm here with Kirby Johnson, farmer in Skagit Valley, and uh, one of the things you grow is cabbage, right? Right, for you sauerkraut. The 2017 growing season was a bit of a wild card for cabbage growers in the coastal region. The spring was a bit cooler with more rain than in recent years. This changed the planting and growing cycle for the season. When it's planted early, it comes in about 75 or 80 days, but when it's planted this late, I don't know if it will or not. But we want to get it out of the field before the frost comes, so I think we'll make it. Yeah, so cabbage for sauerkraut. Yeah. Those little guys grow up and we hope to have 10 pounds of usable sauerkraut from every plant. Wow. This will form a head mm -hmm. and it'll be tight and it'll be uh, oh, 12, 15 pounds. Why is this cabbage good for sauerkraut? It's good for sauerkraut because it forms a big solid head and, and uh, you know, white in color, sauerkraut's got to be white. Mm -hmm. And so the, the color is right and the head size is big and this climate is good for growing cabbage. So good, in fact, in the mid-1900s, Skagit County once grew 95% of the cabbage seed produced in the United States. When we were at our highest production, we were making three million pounds and it represented 
two or three percent of the production in the country. So you can imagine how a lot much of sauerkraut. How long have you been a farmer? All your life? All my life. Almost said a certain number of years, but <laughs> you don't want to divulge. Is it a family farm? So like you farmed and then your dad farmed and then fourth generation. Really? Yeah. My dad had four brothers. My family was three brothers and we farmed together. So here we are, still at it. Kirby's son Stephen is the next generation working on the farm. But when it comes to retiring from the farm, Kirby's got a pretty simple perspective. It's kind of in your blood. I don't know if you ever quit or not. So yeah. I still got a little energy. Just don't ask me to go out after supper with a shovel. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you there. <laughs> Today I'm in Olympia at Olikraut. Since 2008, Olikraut has been handcrafting sauerkrauts, pickles, and sipping brines. My first stop is to meet with the owner, Sash Sunday. And the first thing I wanted to know is what makes Olikraut different from other sauerkrauts? So our product is unpasteurized and raw. So you'll find it in the refrigerated section. Okay. And then also we're totally organic, organically certified. Um, and we're sourcing from local farms. Now, how did you decide that you wanted to produce sauerkraut? <laughs> right. Well, I had been working on a farm and I had an abundance of cabbage. Oh, okay. And so I thought, hey, maybe I'll try making sauerkraut. And I did, and it was the first time that I had tried raw sauerkraut. And I loved it. I ate two gallons in two weeks, <laughs> which is a lot of sauerkraut. <laughs> and, um, and I just couldn't stop from there. And I kept going and I started making different kinds kimchi and different things like that and I just became more and more fanatical until finally it was like okay maybe I should start trying to sell this too. Now that I know where the inspiration comes from I asked Sash to show me the process of making their kraut. We receive all of the cabbage from local farms uh, around our area and then we chop it all up and then it comes down this line and we shred it and we're mixing in the salt down there. And basically for plain sour, like original, it's just cabbage and salt, it's very simple. And then all the microbes are just naturally around. Really? We don't have to add them and they do most of the work for us, which is kind of impressive. It sounds simple enough, so I thought I would try it myself. My first job is at the cabbage shredder. <laughs> Make it look so easy. <laughs> this is the easy part. I'm beginning. We already, we already have the hard part over us. I'm beginning not to trust how easy some of this work will be. I like that. <laughs> that was one job I could have done a lot longer, but it's time to get back to the tour. So this is our fermentation room. Wow. This is where all the magic happens. Wow. So everything hangs out in here while the lactobacilli are breaking down the sugars and the vegetables and making carbon dioxide and lactic acid. And that's what makes sauerkraut sour. There's actually no vinegar, which everyone's always surprised to hear. Right, right. Yeah, it's just a different kind of acid. Sauce said the final step of the process is the jarring, and then the jars are put into the refrigerator and ready for delivery. Now when I get this home uh, and I'm refrigerating myself, what's the shelf life for once it gets home? Uh, six to eight months, probably, oh, as long really? as you keep it in the fridge. I mean, the big thing is keep it under the brine. So when you take some out, push it back down with the fork so that it's under the juice. If it's under the juice, it's going to be, if it's under the brine, everything's fine. That's great. Under yeah. the brine, everything's fine. Right. <laughs> now that I've seen the entire process, it's time to open up a jar and give it a taste. So here's our original. Okay. And that's just cabbage and salt. All right. And we do use a little bit of Jacobson sea salt in every batch. Mm. That is really really tasty. It's not overbearing at all, but you can really taste the ingredients and it tastes really clean yeah. and really fresh. Thank you so much. This was a delicious and educational day. Awesome. So again, to you. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Coming up, we're in the kitchen using cabbage to make two different and delicious dishes. Now we just need more beer. Or exactly. Wine. <laughs> Where's the beer? back at Manu's Bodega. 
a little Latin hideaway that is a little hard to find, making it one of Seattle's best kept secrets. I'll place this off the beaten path a little bit, so whenever I have a friend that wants to grab lunch and I haven't been here for a while, uh, this is one of my go-tos because it's sort of hard to find. You'll probably be uh, looking on your GPS, you know, <laughs> yeah. trying to find that. Right here? You're looking around, and finally, maybe somebody <laughs> will flag you down. It's like, oh, you're looking for bodega? Yeah, it's over there. The shop's Latin American cuisine is known for always being authentic and fresh. Manu loves to use locally sourced ingredients as much as he can, including a Latin American staple, cabbage. It's part of a staple ingredient in, okay. in Latin America. Yeah. It has the texture of crunch. It's refreshing because it has that water content in it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a real humble mm -hmm. ingredient, but it's, it's uh, quite versatile. Yeah, you can do a lot with it. It's now time to get in the kitchen. We're gonna get cooking. Yeah. <laughs> what are we uh, going to make? We're going to showcase a uh, green cabbage today green and a cabbage. purple cabbage. We're going to do okay. it two different ways. Uh, one's going to be a seared cabbage, which we're going to treat like a steak. Really? And then the other one's just going to be a simple kind of like raw shaved Latin flavored um, little coleslaw. Yeah. And we'll serve on the side. And what we're going to do here. So this is a, a beautiful head of cabbage. Yes. We get all our produce from Frank's Quality Produce. Mm -hmm. Puyallup Washington cabbage. That's awesome. And yes. this is just green cabbage. Just humble ingredient. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The first step we're gonna do for this cabbage okay. is we're just gonna simply quarter it. Do you wanna take the knife? Oh, you're gonna make me do it. Okay. Yeah. So just like this, or what's the yep. best way to do it? From top to bottom. From top to bottom. Yep. Right. And you can lay it flat. Okay. And then go we'll do from it again. the core. Yep. Okay. You kind of saw this being done at another restaurant, right? Yeah, I was blown away because this, this cabbage came on a plate by itself. And then when you bit into it, you know, all the lovely like butter flavors started coming out. And I was like, oh, this is genius. I ordered it twice. Ordered it twice. Yeah. We peel off the outer layer of our cabbage while we melt some butter on the stove. Manu sprinkles some salt for seasoning and our wedges are ready for the pan. And work its magic. While our cabbages cook, we start to make our fresh coleslaw. Manu slices up some purple cabbage, chili peppers, and radishes. I add some fresh lime juice and a few mint leaves for freshness. Washington grown mint. Yes. With our coleslaw ready to go, we check in on our green cabbage. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh, those That's are beautiful. looking good. So I'm gonna do the other side. The other now. side. So this can take a little while. Yeah, to this get can it take a little the while. Brown that you want. Sure. Worth the wait. But it's worth the wait. Yeah. It's yeah. Worth while we wait, Manu adds in garlic and capers and the finishing touch, beer. This creates a rich flavored broth for the cabbage to soak in. Basting it with Yeah, oh my gosh. After their little beer bath, our wedges are done and ready. Manu prepares some pork belly to add to our final dish and then tops it off with our fresh red cabbage slaw. With my knife and fork in hand, I'm ready to give it a try. That cabbage, the wedge, is really rich. Yeah, it's not crazy. Mm -hmm. Meaty. It is, it's really meaty. I'm gonna try this. So tangy and fresh tasting. Thank you so much for Our showing pleasure. me these great ways. Yeah, thanks for coming I out. I never would have thought to do with cabbage and it's so delicious. Now we just need more beer. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Where's the beer? To get the recipe for Manu's seared cabbage and fresh coleslaw, head over to wagrown.com. You probably have seen the different cabbage varieties in your local supermarket. Green, purple, and savoy, which is commonly called Napa cabbage. As far as vegetables go, cabbage tends to get a bad rap. In fact, the ancient Greeks believed cabbage would damage their grapes and refuse to plant the vegetable anywhere near their vines. While the Romans and Egyptians ate it with meals simply because they believed it would prevent hangovers from wine. Fast forward a couple thousand years, and attitudes towards cabbage have really changed. Today, almost every country has a traditional dish that features cabbage, like sauerkraut across Europe or kimchi in Korea. Here in the US, you can find cabbage in almost every summer picnic in the form of coleslaw. Cabbage is packed with lots of vitamin C, which our body needs to repair itself after injury. Vitamin C is also an important antioxidant and helps prevent damage to the trillions of cells in our body. Like most vegetables,
cabbage is a good source of fiber, which helps promote regular and proper digestion. So the next time you're looking to change up your veggies for dinner, consider this healthy and versatile ingredient. Coming up, Tomas is on the streets with another type of cabbage dish, kimchi. I've had kimchi in Korea before. Oh, no, no, so, so the real deal. The real deal, and this is good. And we'll be in the Second Harvest Kitchen making stuffed cabbage with Northwest Salmon. As urban populations continue to rise in Washington, area farmlands are feeling the pressures. From 2005 to 2015, Washington lost over 400,000 acres of farmland to development and other uses. In Clark County alone, more than 170 farms have been lost since 2007. Stu Tree Fry is the Southwest Regional Manager of the Washington State Conservation Commission. And he says this is a challenge that conservation districts are helping farmers solve. The conservation district will work with the farmer and write a conservation plan mm -hmm. that the farmer can, as they have the resources to do it, to, uh, to implement that plan. April Joy Farm in Clark County works with their local conservation district to stay sustainable financially through improved conservation practices. Denise Smee is the manager of Clark Conservation District who works with April to keep the farm working under the urban pressures. So Denise, how does the Conservation District support those urban farmers, those smaller farms? A lot of times it's not the traditional best management practices that we work with other farms on. We uh, work with more of the economics of farming to help them stay in business and keep that land working. Most recently, the Conservation District helped April write and receive a soil health grant to purchase a system for generating on-farm compost. Using farm-generated compost will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and save April thousands of dollars she otherwise would have spent buying soil amendments. Our Conservation District has been a partner for us from day one and we're really fortunate and blessed to have them. In fact, for farms of our scale and size that are facing a lot of development pressures, their services are absolutely essential to keeping our farm viable. This hedgerow in low swale is an example of that, where we have put in a lot of native plant shrubs and uh, trees that allow us to filter water and runoff from area neighbors that are um, not organic in nature, and that is increasing our water quality as well as providing a buffer for us and our actual field crops. So what are we looking at here? It's beautiful. Well, this is one example of a partnership with uh, Denise from the Cart Conservation District. Mm -hmm. This is a pollinator hedgerow that provides habitat, forage, uh, and um, shelter for our native pollinators. As you can see, we have a lot of crops in the field mm -hmm. that are dependent on these pollinators to produce good yields. And here's another example, Val, of a project we've done with Denise, uh, is our drip irrigation. We not only installed our drip irrigation system for water conservation, purposes, but then we also uh, worked um, with our partners at NRCS to put in soil moisture monitoring sensors so we could more accurately track how much water we're using. As you can see, we're not growing one or two crops. We've got 45 plant families here represented. And so understanding every one of those with how much water they need is critical for our water usage. Like other urban areas in Washington, small farms are an important part of Clark County's heritage and economy. Conservation districts throughout the state are working to keep small-scale farms alive and well as our population continues to increase. Hey, let's go! You can travel all over the world, and no matter where you go, you're sure to find a dish or two made with cabbage. It's hearty and versatile and comes in tons of varieties. Well, our friends here at the Crate Food Truck in Spokane are making a Korean staple, kimchi. And did I mention they're putting it on pork belly sliders? Yes. So Eric, tell me a little bit about Crate Food Truck. So we try and do those flavors that are as big as we possibly can and bold, and then take from some of those different cultures that we really, really like to eat from. Now, Cabbage is a staple in your pork belly slider, is that correct? Absolutely. Tell me about that. 
So we use cabbage a lot on the truck. Uh, it's got great texture, it's a good filler. Um, you get the sweetness and then the sour and the bitter with it. So you get a lot going on with cabbage. People think it's kind of like a, you know, like a basic vegetable and I think it's a star of the vegetable world. Now it's time to see what people think of this star vegetable in these pork belly sliders. Now let me ask you a question. Do you enjoy cabbage? I love cabbage. I do. Sometimes. Sometimes? <laughs> you do? What are some yeah, of your favorite sometimes. ways to enjoy it? Probably kimchi the most. Kimchi the most? Yeah, sauerkraut, kimchi. Just like a really finely sliced like slaw. I love kimchi. Perfect, because I happen to have here a pork belly slider with a Korean kimchi on it. Ooh. Why don't you give that a try and tell All me what right. you think? That's delicious. Mm-hmm. No words needed. You already know how she thinks about it. The kimchi's really nice. It's got a, like a unique flavor, but it doesn't overwhelm the, the pork belly. I've had kimchi in Korea before. Oh, no. so, so the real deal. The real deal, and this is good. This is good, man. Yeah. And now it's time for me to finally get a taste. You're on to something here. <laughs> this is really good. It's just very light and fresh. You're good. Thank you. No, thank you. I'm here with my friend Laurent Zerati, and he is the owner and chef of Fleur de Sel, uh, artisan crepery in Spokane, also the owner of another restaurant called Fleur de Sel. We're gonna be making some great stuff here in the kitchen oh, at Second uh, Harvest. At Second Harvest, yes. Yeah, and you know this place well. I do, I do. I, I, uh, I teach uh, cooking class for yeah. their customer once a month. Uh, people that uh, want to learn uh, simple food, mm -hmm. uh, cooking with their heart, and uh, uh, with what we have in the warehouse, because that warehouse is big. It's big and it's busy. It's busy. It's this is such a great space that we I get know. to work in. So what are we? I, I see this lovely head of cabbage here. <laughs> <My> petit chou. <laughs> this is. Uh, <laughs> this is. So that's uh, what you call it in in French. A chou, a yeah, a cabbage. So what are we gonna do with this? Well, uh, I thought we would uh, do a, a, a twist of a special tea uh, in France. Okay. Uh, it's a stuffed cabbage. Stuffed cabbage. So usually. Cabbage. It's a whole cabbage mm -hmm. that is stuffed with uh, pork sausages. A whole cabbage. The whole cabbage. Okay. But Beautiful. I thought we're in Washington, mm -hmm. and let's do something a little different yeah. with some Washington produce. I and, love uh, it. Uh, I thought salmon is a specialty okay. of the Northwest. It is. So we're gonna stuff uh, individual cabbage with uh, a duxelle of mushroom, a mush mushroom cream, and uh, some uh, Northwest salmon. That sounds amazing. So okay. how do we so, get started? Well, we have uh, several uh, things to do. Okay. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, uh, removing the leaf of the cabbage. Laurent begins to core the cabbage. Once the core is removed, he spreads the cabbage apart and pulls off individual leaves. Tell me about cabbage. Like, I mean, you can do a lot with oh, cabbage. You can, I think it's one of the it. great... Uh, uh, I have uh, red and green cabbage on the on the menu mm -hmm. uh, for the winter, from the fall to the to the spring, because I think it's uh, one of the king uh, uh, vegetable of the winter. Yeah. Next, we blanch the cabbage leaves in boiling water for about five minutes. When they're done, we give them an ice bath and set them to the side. Next, we start to make a mushroom duxelle. It's a classic. Uh, every kitchen. Uh, in France, as a duxelle, it's like your bechamel, it's like your mm -hmm. pastry cream for a pastry chef. Okay. Laurent chops shallots, garlic, and mushrooms and begins to saute them in a pan. Soon, it's time to add some cream and salt and pepper. So a lot of, uh, a lot of dishes you can make with uh, cabbage. But Seems I like a lot of cultures. I mean, all have, over. Have yes, a yes. special. I think it's very. Uh, dish. So we're gonna reduce that until there is no more cream. Okay. Huh? And while we have that, we're gonna prepare the butter sauce. Oh, I forgot how to say it. Yes, you know. The, uh, beurre beurre blanc. 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 To begin our sauce, we mince some shallots. Then we are going to put some white wine from uh, Walla Walla. And we're going to reduce that. I think uh, that's good. Yeah, that's yeah, very a little good. bit more. <laughs> I like that. So we're going to reduce that to dry. Same. So, oh, okay. this almost dry, Yeah. this almost dry. While our duxel and sauce reduce on the stove, Laurent slices our Northwest salmon into small pieces. Now, 
We have our duke cell. Mm -hmm. That needs to be cool. So we're going to cool, cool it. Okay. Once the duke cell is cool, we can assemble our stuffed cabbages for steaming. First, we lay out our cabbage leaves, spread on our cold mushroom duke cell, add our salmon, and season with salt and pepper. And now, okay. we're going to do the same thing. Double so, layers. Yes, we're going to uh -huh. layer everything. I'm getting it now. So we're going to we're going to bring all that together, the four square. We twist our wrapped cabbages and then they're ready to be steamed. And we're going to go uh, wait until it's cooked, reach 155 uh, degree. Okay. We're going to measure it with a, uh, a thermometer. Yeah. And when it's done, we're going to try to eat it. While the cabbages steam, we finish our butter sauce. We pour in some cream, whisk in butter, and then add salt, lemon juice, and fresh dill. Once our butter sauce is ready and our stuffed cabbages reach 155 degrees, it's time to put it all together. Little packages. Okay. Can't wait to see what it looks like inside. Oh, that's so pretty. All right, go for it. Okay. You want oh, thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Huh? Mm-hmm. Delicious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm is universal, you know? I know. To get the recipe for Laurent's stuffed cabbage, head over to wagrown.com. Whether it's sauerkraut, coleslaw, or kimchi, cabbage is one of America's favorite sides. That's it for this edition of Washington Grown. Thanks for watching.